Hello. I hope you are well. On Great Earth. My name is Dan. We got a lot to get into today. Much of what has to do with not getting sick. And we're like this all night. I promise that won't happen again. <laughs> okay. Again, I, I hope you are well, even if you're watching this on replay. I hope you're well. We got a lot of news to get to get through that has a lot to do with dams in the United States deteriorating pretty much. No maintenance. It's not cost effective keeping them around and seeing a lack of flow of fish as a result. So we're going to, we have a few stories regarding successful dam removals that ended up being boons to local wildlife, especially fish. We're going to look at a couple of incidents involving migrants, uh, tragedies. See, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. There's a long list of stories for today. Our first story: nearly 200 cases of dengue virus reported in New York and New Jersey. CDC. New York has reported 143 cases, and New Jersey has reported 41. Nearly 200 people have been infected with dengue in the states of New York and New Jersey so far this year, according to data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. New York has reported 143 cases, and New Jersey has reported 41. Dengue transmission is typically common in tropical, subtropical areas of the world, according to the CDC. Over 2,500 people have been infected in the United States so far this year, about five times higher than the same time last year. Puerto Rico currently makes up a bulk of those cases, with over 1,700 reported. The U.S. territory declared a public health emergency back in March. The CDC issued a health alert last month warning health care providers of an increased risk of dengue virus infection this year. Globally, new cases of dengue have been uh, the highest on record, according to the CDC. I've had this and my ticker at least on the bottom of dengue figure being on the rise for months now. We've reported on it several times. Not on the Twitch channel. Twitch channel, we're starting. This is all new. I'm going to, going forward, until I can justify the restreaming to YouTube, rec uh, record the stream while also streaming it to Twitch, and then uploading that video onto YouTube later as an instant premiere. Um, I digress. Dengue viruses spread through mosquito bites. The most common symptom is a fever with aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, and rash. Symptoms usually begin two weeks after being bitten by an mos infected mosquito and last two to seven days. Most people recover after about a week. The best way to prevent dengue fever is to avoid mosquito bites. You see the Northeast and Florida are lighting up with dengue cases.
mosquito-borne disease, dengue fever, caused by the dengue virus. It is frequently asymptomatic. Vomiting, yep, high fever. Now, uh, there's no specific treatment for dengue fever. A whole lot of different symptoms of dengue fever, making it difficult. And print here, blanching on the fever skin. Oof. Spotted rash. Most frequently transmitted by the bite of mosquitoes, in a particular genus. Uh, with climate change causing so much whirlwind and chaos, the one thing that we always seem to forget about are mosquitoes. We can't let the areas that normally aren't huge boons to their population, at the very least, we have to take climate change seriously as a result of mosquito-borne diseases, insect-borne diseases, rodent diseases. A lot of these diseases, these illnesses, ramp up alongside a higher temperature. There's a correlation between the two. Not a coincidence. That mosquito-borne illnesses and diseases ramp up in areas that are subtropical or tropical that would be able to host these uh, pathogens in these particular mosquito uh, genus. I can't imagine when mosquitoes were any larger than they are now, being such a huge threat. Okay, so one of the... Um, I was trying to find more severe dengue symptoms, and uh, those are pretty horrible here. The World Health Organization International Classification of Disease divides dengue fever into two classes, uncomplicated and severe. Severe dengue is defined as that associated with severe bleeding, severe organ dysfunction, or severe plasma leakage. Your veins leak plasma, Severe dengue can develop suddenly, sometimes after a few days as the fever subsides. Leakage of plasma from the capillaries results in extreme low blood pressure and hypovolemic shock. Patients with severe plasma leakage may have fluid accumulation in the lungs. Or abdomen insufficient protein in the blood, or thickening of the blood. Severe dengue is a medical emergency that can cause damage to organs, leading to multiple organ failure and death. So it can be confused with a whole host of different diseases, including measles. So if we see a measles outbreak, is it really measles or is it dengue fever? It could be both. <laughs> There's no cure for it, there's no treatment. And uh, you get every symptom that all the other like influenza, fevers, you get it all. Vomiting, rash, diarrhea, muscle and joint pains, mouth and nose bleeding, headache, sudden onset fever, hypertension, pain, the list goes on. But 
your, your plasma leaking from your veins as a side effect of this virus as it attacks your body. Terrifying. Be careful out there. I can't say use bug spray because that just, they just die after they land on you, but they still bite you. It's not like they make you invisible. There's nothing that makes you invisible to a mosquito. There's really no way to avoid getting bit by mosquitoes. They're everywhere. On everywhere, especially you know, whenever it's warmer out and wetter. You get more mosquitoes and you get more mosquito-borne diseases. It's all just horrible. Now we have nearly 200 cases of this dengue virus reported. In New York and New Jersey, with 1,700 being reported in Puerto Rico. These are. This is. Large news. Especially. It feels like the early days of COVID, where people are just dropping dead in the hundreds around the world while this virus is creeping up on both coasts they got heat heat as an illness ramping up on both coasts of the United States they have heat ramping up throughout northern India Pakistan Middle East and northern Africa West Africa how's Nigeria doing in this heat country of over 230 million people. It is not that we haven't recorded or seen these temperatures before, but we've never seen temperatures like this sweeping across in huge swaths of the planet, not just cities, that's the problem. We're not just talking about cities or regions, We're talking about entire areas that have just gone from mild winter to incredibly hot summer. It's all related. This is an article from a year ago, but it's rather important. Atmospheric dust may have hidden true extent of global heating. Yeah. Material from dry landscapes have surged since the late 1800s, possibly helping to cool the planet for decades. Dust that billows up from desert storms and arid landscapes has helped cool the planet for the past several decades, and its presence in the atmosphere may have obscured the true extent of global heating caused by fossil fuel emissions. Atmospheric dust has increased by about 55% since the mid-1800s, and analyses suggest that increasing dust may have hidden up to 8% of warming from carbon emissions. About 26 million tons of dust are suspended in our atmosphere, scientists estimate. Its effects are complicated. Yeah, definitely not cooling the planet anytime soon. We are seeing monstrous temperatures, especially in the southwest here, California, all the way up through central California, Nebraska. New temperatures in 100. It's not just Las Vegas. It's not just Austin. You know, it's bigger than that. It's half the country not just that oh there's never been this temperature here before recorded or reported that's not what we're saying we're saying that 
these capitals from these cities all together at once becoming the same temperature like this all together at once like 100 degrees this is not normal this kills crops this dries out water this dries out lakes this causes dehydration this causes drought see here it's just severe drought all across the country there is a better map that I would use for this but I wanted to check the temperature real quick Hundred degrees, hundred degrees. That's the other thing too. It's not just because it's getting hotter around the world. The nights aren't cooling. The nights are still in the nineties, eighties. You'll have a hundred and ten, hundred and twenty degree day in an eighty five degree night. There's no relief. Only escape from the sun. So 117 degrees in the UAE. Around 10 degrees. It's Algeria, Morocco. There's just There's not an end in sight, you know what I mean? It's progressively it's worse worse and it's cumulative. It just keeps getting amplified as more gets caught in the atmosphere, more particulates that cause greenhouse gases like uh carbon dioxide take hold in the atmosphere. Did you know that water tra under sea trawling, they take a huge net with two weights on each side and drag it across the ocean floor? Did you know it takes about nine to ten years? But those consequences are releasing, you know, millions of tons of carbon dioxide through the disturbance of the seafloor and puts that carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. So what if all of a sudden we are seeing, hey, there is a great amount of more carbon dioxide that is unexplained in the atmosphere and nobody seems to be able to claim it or we can't seem to follow it to a region really to put blame on it because it's that amount of carbon dioxide entering in the atmosphere. So if we're dredging, if we're trawling all over the place in huge amounts, we're releasing huge amounts of particulates carbon dioxide into the atmosphere it might take longer than we think because to go from the surface of an, the ocean to the bottom of the ocean floor particles take about a hundred years we're not doing good we're in trouble and it kind of freaks me out to see temperatures like this. Honestly, it's abnormal. Even Las Vegas is sweltering. Las Vegas is seeing its hottest temperatures on record. Florida's starting to see higher temperatures, but it's more you get into the moisture, the humidity, which areas have what, and temperature affecting all of them. It's not just that this, this state or this state is 110 degrees. It's that this whole region is 110 degree plus. So there seems to be no shelter from it. People want to take a vacation from the heat. They want to go to somewhere cooler. Where is that exactly? Where would that be? Alaska? Alaska's at planning level five. And they're getting smoke jumpers throughout the entire country. Like this is um, from the entire country are going to Alaska. Things are heating up and picking up a lot. 
we have no one else to blame but our own uselessness we see a threat coming from decades away and we allow profits and corporate favors we'll look the other way give you a ridiculous amount of money that'll change your grandchildren's lives if you just look the other way and after having so much of uh science already known before the 70s before the 80s when industrialization really took hold and we just it just became massive the influx of carbon in our atmosphere our carbon budget people can't survive outside in this temperature and people are being made to live outside in this temperature being made to live outside being homeless during a time where you have a disease like dengue fever making the rounds but also the increased heat at night there's no relief it's terror day in day out night day out while it'll be 80 degrees at night 9500 degrees at during the day the asphalt, the ground you walk on, is 60 to 70 degrees higher, it can be, after direct sunlight. So say it's 100 degrees where you're standing, your feet could be experiencing 140 degrees at least. It'll be slow, but you can definitely cook an egg on the ground parts of Arizona. I don't know if that's from the direct sunlight or if that's from the actual heat on the, because you would have to find the right blacktop. That would be interesting. Well, not, not really interesting, I'm pretty sure. But the, um, have I not seen the videos of people frying eggs on the ground yet? You've seen one, but I haven't seen many. Turkey. Turkey. Raft crash. Uh, DW News doesn't do the right spelling of Turkey. <laughs> Raft frat crash on Aegean coast kills at least seven migrants. Smugglers frequently risk lives trying to get migrants from Turkey to Greece and European Union member state. 19 people were saved by the Turkish Coast Guard after a raft carrying migrants hit rocks off the Turkish coast. A life raft carrying migrants on the Aegean Sea crashed Tuesday into rocks near Sesme, a town on Turkey's Aegean coast. So far, at least seven people on board have died, the Turkish Coast Guard said. 19 people, including children, were rescued off Turkey Izmar province, while a search for one missing is underway. Turkish Interior Minister Ali Yerlikaya said on social media platform X, Rescue operations underway. One helicopter, four Coast Guard vessels, and a diving team were involved in the search and rescue operation, he added. A life raft carrying the migrants was pushed back earlier by Greek Coast Guard towards Turkish waters. The Turkish Coast Guard claimed citing some of the rescued migrants. Coast Guard and local fishermen rescue several. Earlier on Tuesday, the Coast Guard received reports of migrants on a small Turkish island off the coast near Izmir, the Coast Guard said on its website. A fisherman rescued one person from the sea, suspecting others were still in the water. The Coast Guard saved 18 others from the island, but one person remains missing. 
smugglers risk migrant lives on a daily basis. Along Turkey's Aegean coastline, smugglers frequently attempt to bring people from Turkey to Greece, which is an EU member. The Turkish Coast Guard reports intercepting boats carrying migrants almost daily, especially during the summer months. Hell. Four migrants die while attempting to cross the English Channel from northern France. French authorities say four migrants, this is from the Associated Press, have died while trying to cross the English Channel from France to the UK. Their inflatable boat capsized and punctured off the coast in northern France. Olo Surmer. Four migrants have died while trying to cross the English Channel on an inflatable boat from France to the UK, French authorities said Friday. The migrants' vessel capsized and punctured off the coast of Palou de Mer in northern France. The prefecture responsible for the region said in a statement. 63 people were rescued by the French Coast Guard. A French Navy patrol boat spotted the overcrowded vessel early Friday as it deflated off the French coast. Several people were drifting in the water while others were still clinging to the broken rubber dinghy, statement said. Navy vessels, a fishing boat, and a Navy helicopter joined the effort. Survivors were brought to the shore in Bolo and receive medical condition, attention and temporary shelter, the statement also said. Migrants trying to reach the UK risk drowning as they try to cross the busy English Channel, often abroad crowded, unseaworthy boats. French maritime officials responsible for the Channel and the North Sea warned anyone who plans to cross the Channel reconsidered due to the many risks involved in the perilous journey. This is tragic. An estimated 30,000 people made the crossing in 2023. And last month, British authorities rescued 80 migrants at sea after a small boat got into difficulty while crossing the English Channel from France. This is becoming a... very new route when it comes to migrant crossing. Trying to cross the English Channel. Strict asylum rules and poor treatment of migrants are pushing people north to the UK. Well, there you go.
Three fear trapped after landslide hits houses in Matsuyama, Western Japan. Authorities in Matsuyama City in the Western Japanese prefecture of Imi are searching for three people after a landslide hit a residential area. The city's fire officials say a hillslide near Matsuyama Castle collapsed before 4 a.m. on Friday. The collapsed area was 50 meters wide and 100 meters high. The mud entered houses in an apartment building. They say there have been multiple reports of gas leaks in the area. Officials are trying to locate the leaks. Inside is dangerous, but... The whole hillside next to the castle collapsing. This out of Nigeria. Twelve reported dead after school in Nigeria collapses during classes. About 120 students and teachers trapped, but authorities yet to confirm number of students and teachers killed. A two-story school in north-central Nigeria collapsed during morning classes on Friday, trapping about 120 students and teachers and setting off a frantic search for those in the rubble. A local television station reported 12 deaths. Authorities are yet to confirm the number of students and teachers killed in Saints Academy College in Plateau's in plateaus states busa buji community but channels television said 26 people were being treated along with the deaths citing a witness account at a nearby hospital nigeria's national emergency management agency said rescue and health workers as well as security forces have been deployed at the scene it said that several students had been killed Approximately 120 people were trapped, with many evacuated. Plateau Commissioner for Information Musa Ashams said in a statement, To ensure proper, prompt medical attention, the government has instructed hospitals to prioritize treatment without documentation or payment. The state government blamed the tragedy on the school's weak structure and location near a riverbank. It urged schools facing similar issues to close down. Dozens of villagers gathered near the school, some leaping and others offering to help as excavators combed through the debris. One woman was seen wailing and attempting to get go closer to the rubble as others held her back. Building collapses are becoming common in Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, with more than a dozen such incidents recorded in the last two years. Authorities often blame such disasters on failure to enforce building safety regulations and poor maintenance. This leads us into conversations and news stories regarding dams in the United States. This is an update regarding the Rapidan Dam. The situation still sucks. And this bridge on the Blue Earth River is still closed out of fear that the erosion has weakened the support structures underneath the bridge support pillars. So this bridge could still be at risk of failing. Even not all the way, in my opinion, the whole bridge would be lost in the case that it were to have any kind of uh, disruption in its standing. You drive away you know, 10, 20 feet of mud that's been built up around the support structures, or worse, it hammers them until they break. It's 
conditions are still too dangerous. I'm sure they have drones flying around and taking a look as they could. But I'm sure that the load bearing of this bridge is considered zero. They're not allowing anyone on it. And as far as I can, uh, I've read, not even emergency crews can are trusting it. It is a very, uh, it's a rather new bridge. So it would be a terrible loss. And this bridge would also, if it dislodges, if it falls away, breaks apart, it'll smash into what's the remaining remnants of the dam. Is that going to cause further destruction on the river? It's currently still eroding the western side of the dam. But the whole dam face with its channels and still face failure as a result of an entire bridge washing out into it. This bridge is pretty big too. It's not uh, not tiny. It would be a big deal if this bridge failed and wound up in uh, a further dam breach. As far as I can find, that is the latest on the uh, Rapidan Dam. Very important article. Vermont floods raise concerns about future of states, hundreds of aging dams. This is something that has to be discussed today, now, all over the place, all over the country. It needs to be a topic. Because a lot of these hydroelectric uh, uh, power uh, dams, you know they're they're old they're not modernized at all they're just maintained to a bare minimum but water they release from a dam either out of the spillway or of a dam failure some of the strongest water you can experience it's a huge wall of water in that initial surge that comes out that would have everybody worried but also Vermont has the concern of its valleys being completely flooded out again. Now, if they have dam failures coupled with three to five, ten inches of rain, as uh, Hurricane Barrel made its way all the way northeast, riding along the Great Lakes, very complicated into the storm as it finally makes its way out. It's still see this little guy right here. He's not even a name storm. He's already causing a, ru a ruckus Myrtle Beach. Boston. The latest flooding in Vermont has added fresh urgency to concerns about the hundreds of dams in the state, a third of which are more than a century old. This week's deluge from the remnants of Hurricane Barrel wasn't as bad for the hundreds of dams compared to last year's floods, when five failed and nearly 60 overtopped. But the second bad flood in a year raised concerns about the viability of these structures as climate change brings heavier rains and more powerful storms. The many thousands of obsolete dams that remain in our rivers do not provide protection from flooding despite what many think. Andrew Fisk, the Northeast Regional Director for the Environmental Advocacy Group American Rivers, said, Dams not created specifically for flood protection are regularly full and do not provide storage capacity. And they also frequent direct water outside of the main channel at high velocities, which causes bank erosions in the impact communities. That's what we were just talking about. That uh, impact, that, uh, that wall of water that comes out at a high velocity to shred 
both structures in its wake. The challenge facing dams in Vermont is playing across the, out across the country as more dams overtop or fail during heavy rains. The Rapidan Dam, a 1910 hydroelectric dam in Minnesota, was badly damaged last month by the second worst flood in its history. And in Texas, flooding damaged Lake Livingston Dam Spillway about 65 miles northeast of Houston. There are roughly 90,000 significant dams in the United States. At least 4,000 are in poor or unsatisfactory condition and could kill people or only harm the environment if they failed, according to data from the United States Army Corps of Engineers. They need inspections, upgrades, and even emergency repairs. You get these states that take in millions of dollars for dam repair, and they make like one repair because there's so much to do and it's so complicated and expensive. Like the rest of New England, Vermont has mostly older small dams built to power textile mills, store water, or supply irrigation to farms. The concern is they have outlived their usefulness and climate change could bring storms they were never built to withstand. The floods last year in Vermont drew outsized attention to dams mostly due to the failures and near failures. In the capital, Montpelier, a dam was at risk of sending water over the emergency spillway and through parts of the town. The National Inventor of Dams, a database regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, lists 372 dams in the state with 62 rated as high hazard, which means lives could be lost if the dam fails. Ten of those were rated in poor condition which means remedial action is necessary. State officials say they actually regulate 417 dams and that there are hundreds more too small and of minimal hazard to be regulated. The last storm, the storms last year, led to a rapid inspection of all state's dams with more than $1.5 million spent to stabilize and repair storm damage. Team has never had never been faced with a situation of you know eight inches of widespread rain across essentially the entire state of Vermont. Neil Kamen, the director of Water Investment Division in the Vermont Department of Environmental Conversation Conservation, said it stressed all the facilities that the state of Vermont owns and that the dam safety team manages what build up hundreds of dams caused by the failures that you know about and created a whole bunch of unknown uncertainties out there on the landscape in terms of downstream risk due to, you know, prospective dams having been destabilized. In response, the legislator approved the hiring of four staffers in the dam safety program, bringing the total to nine and allocated an additional $4 million to a dam safety program up from 200,000? 200,000, that's, what are you gonna do with a dam, $100,000? That's nothing. $4 million seems a lot more in line of what I expect to hear whenever I'm here, like, oh yeah, this massive dam needs repairs or it could fail. $4 million, yeah, it's a giant dam and it's complicated. It'll take time depending on what the problem is. We're talking about hundreds of dams, hundreds of dams throughout the state of Vermont, that if they bring in, storm brings in another five to 10 inches of rain again, topping off these dams, that can cause statewide flooding again. So at least they're taking it seriously, I guess. You have to decommission the dams before they become a problem. Because the hydroelectric 
scams aren't it's not worth the risk now we've seen dams when they fail it's not just the concrete structures the metal structures it's the earthen dams when the earth gives way like we saw in midland michigan and uh uh, what was the other damn failure in Michigan then? Edinburgh? Edinburgh? I can't remember. can't remember the name of it, but it starts with an E, I believe. Julie Moore, Secretary of Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, said during a news conference Friday that inspections found that Wynuski River Valley Flood Control Reservoir continue to do their job well and that levels at the Waterbury Reservoir are stabilizing with plenty of storage remaining. Those dams in the East Bear Dam are critical to flood control in an area that stretches from Bear to Essex. She also said that officials had completed inspections at seven particularly at-risk dams in the northern part of the state and that no damage was identified. The floods this year came too soon for the additional money and staffing to have an impact. But Cayman said that experience of responding to last year's flood helped shape a more robust response from the team this time around. The biggest difference between the response this year and last year is the fact that we had the game plan work out for widespread events that would stress a large number of facilities all at once. Is it all at once? Crazy again. Seeing rapid temperature escalating across the country, increasing across the country, causing heat exhaustion and heat stroke. There's more. There are dams that are being leveled, dams that are being taken down. So that's the Elizabeth Dam in Pittsburgh. First controlled demolition date set for dam on Monon. Monongala River near Elizabeth. That's what we're looking at just a minute ago. Yeah, July 10th was the date. Removing the dam will create a continuous pool of riverway stretching 30 miles from Charlie Roy to Braddock. Pennsylvania improving navigation on the lower Manan Gala River, the Halle River.
last major dam on Maryland's had a Pisco River target for removal. This is the Daniels Dam built in the early 1800s. Three dams have been dismantled on the main portion of the Patapisco River in Maryland since 2010. The fourth and final major barrier may soon go away too. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in May award 1.8 million to the nonprofit group American Rivers to begin the planning and initial design phase for the removal of the Daniels Dam. The project will have broad environmental benefits, said Jesse Thomas Blate, Director of Restoration for American Rivers, or American Rivers again. With the dam gone, River Herring and Shad will gain 65 miles of spawning habitat and American eels would gain nearly three times that. We're very excited. This is the final piece to the restoration puzzle we're working on in the Patapisco. Patapsco. Patapsco begins at the confluence of its north and south branches near Marriottsville and winds its way 40 miles to Baltimore Harbor. Nearly half of its drainage basin has been developed. Daniel's Dam was built in 1833 to power mills that have long since closed. It is no longer needed. <clears throat> the dam's owner, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, supports the group's move, said Greg Bortz, an agency spokesperson. This dam is over 100 years old. That is wild. The state will partner with American Rivers in the removal process. The Daniels Dam project was one of 46 projects nationwide receiving a total of $240 million in NOAA grants to support improvements to fish habitat. The effort to reopen the Patasco began in 2010 with the removal of Union Dam. That was followed by the removal of the Simkins Dam in 2011 and Lowood Dam in 2019. So far, the campaign appears to be working as advertised. When Lowood Dam was still in place, the eel ladder attached to the Daniels Dam recorded only a couple dozen uses each year. Since then, observers have counted nearly 80,000 eels Board said, dam removal advocates will have to contend with several issues before demolition can begin. The Daniels area is one of eight developed access points managed as part of a, the popular Patapsco Valley State Park. The dam, 27 feet high and 450 feet long, creates two miles of slow moving water prized by anglers and swimmers. Right now, it looks like a lake. It will look more like a river channel. It will be moving pretty fast through here, through there. She added that the planning process will include outreach to affected users and recommendations on where they can find similar recreational opportunities nearby. Talking about probably a splash pad. All dams posed some risk to human safety, Bort said, but Daniels had experienced fewer incidents than blow dam. In the past 15 years, there has been three emergency incidents on record. The most recent, a near drowning in 2020. None resulted in death. The project will also proceed cautiously. So, talking about a lot of different projects, a lot of dams being removed, a lot of work.
This is from the Seattle Times. U.S. and Canada reach deal on Columbia River Treaty. In a long-awaited breakthrough, the U.S. and Canada have reached an agreement in principle renewing the Columbia River Treaty, which governs the use of the most important river flowing through the two nations. The modernized treaty, which will need to be approved by the U.S. Senate and the Canadian Prime Minister, was announced Thursday. It updates the treaty that has managed the Columbia Basin and its hydropower dams for more than 50 years. The dams control flooding while also providing reliable flows critical for irrigation, fish, electricity, and other needs. The potential deal comes at a time when the Northwest is facing surging demand for power. The development of data centers and more people adopting electric vehicles and appliances are squeezing power supplies. Okay, here's the map here. This is another article about the governing Columbia River. I believe it's the same article. These are U.S. federal dams on this map here. Talking about dams, this is a great deal of them. Huge amount of dams. The northwest. Indigenous tribes have long wanted the Columbia to flow more like a natural river instead of a series of reservoirs with slow moving water that often heat up to temperatures that kill migrating salmon. Getting rid of the dam will allow the salmon to survive their journeys. U.S. and Canadian officials said the agreement would establish a tribal-led body that will provide recommendations on how treaty operations can better support ecosystem needs and tribal and indigenous cultural values. In a written statement, Chief Keith Crow of the Silex Okanagan Nation in British Columbia that the agreement gave him hope that one day his grandchildren might harvest salmon in the upper Columbia River region.
Canada has providing up to 1 million acre feet of water a year to help juvenile salmon on their migration to the Pacific with up to an additional half million acre feet in dry years, subject to negotiation between the countries Ogard or Save Our Wild Salmon said. Have to do better. North Korea released water from border dam despite flooding concerns, Will said, says. South Korea previously urged the the Democratic Republic Democratic People's Republic of Korea North Korea you can see here this picture here is uh, what happens when dam water the high velocity used as a weapon here shreds the land and erodes it immediately. While this is paywalled. We get the gist in this picture here and in this uh, Headline. Thank you for joining me so far. If you haven't already, please click the follow button on my stream. It helps me out immensely. You see, I used to use YouTube. Primarily, I never used to restream or anything. What I what I have to do is start over on Twitch. Is what I'm doing here now. I had over 6,500 subscribers on my YouTube channel, but that's been going down since my activity on it as live streaming has ceased. Now, what I do is. Eventually, I will restream. So I'll have like multiple uh, platforms. As of right now, um, that's a subscription I'm not willing to take to uh, restream on both uh, YouTube and uh, Twitch. So as of right now, I'll go live on Twitch and I'll upload that recording onto. YouTube later. I'm planning on going live every day, 5:30 p.m. with some of the latest climate-related media news that I can find. A lot of it being paywalled is a bummer. There are ways around it, but I don't know if it's legal to do so. Like. On a stream, a lot of gray areas, a lot of ways to get newspapers and other things out of scanned, but I don't know if it's legal to display them. You know what I mean? This sounds like uh, Sounds like North Korea using water as a weapon.
You were set to wind down Gaza Pier operations. Now we've seen President Biden say that uh, Israel is making it very hard, very difficult to get A through. And this pier operation was such a desperate attempt at you know, grasping at straws. And it's being wind down. That's to wind down. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says U.S. will wind down peer operations in relatively short order. The United States has said it will soon end operations from its peer designed to increase the flow of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip amid Israel's continuing war. The $230 million pier has rep repeatedly been detached from the shore because of weather conditions since its initial installation in mid-May, and the project also faced problems with the distribution of assistance due to conditions on shore. I do anticipate that in relatively short order, we will wind down pier operations, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told the journalist on Thursday. Pentagon spokesperson Major General Pat Ryder said in a statement that the pier will soon cease operations with more details on that process and timing available in the coming days. United Nations report says 96% of Gaza's population is food insecure and one in five Palestinians, or about 495,000 people, face starvation amid Israel's nine-month war on the territory. While the pier has brought in 8,100 metric tons of aid to a marshalling area on Gaza's shore since it started operating in May, the 370 meter or 1,200 foot floating pier has had to be removed multiple times because of bad weather. Sullivan said the pier helped bring urgently needed food and other aid to Gaza, but Additional supplies are now coming into the Palestinian enclave via land routes. routes. The real issue right now is not about getting aid into Gaza. It's about aid, about getting aid around Gaza effectively, he told reporters. Military personnel attempted to re-anchor the temporary Gaza pier to the beach on Wednesday after technical and weather related issues, but were unable to do so. The project has also been hampered by security threats that prompted aid agencies to halt distribution of the food and other supplies into Gaza. The Aid groups have said that while any amount of food for Gaza is welcome, many have criticized the project as a costly distraction, saying the U.S. should concentrate on pressuring Israel to allow more aid through land borders, which would have long been considered the most productive option. The U.N. suspended all World Food Program deliveries from the pier after a June 8th Israel military raid that secured the release of four Israeli hostages that killed hundreds of Palestinians, citing concerns that troops used an area near there for flying out the rescued hostages by helicopter. Aid flowing through the pier that then began piling up the secure area on the beach but the WFP eventually hired contractors to move it to storage areas for further distribution. The U.S. Defense Department said this week that a significant amount of aid had been cleared out. So this um, here really didn't wasn't really effective. And even when you get it on land, it's impossible to get the aid around to the people that need it. Either it's too dangerous or it's just not possible. P 
people are being made to suffer. Our last ditch effort this year not really do much also when it came to airdrops as well that was mostly wound up in the water and people drowned trying to get it the aid it's insane what are some one million people supposed to do on the brink of famine Thirty-eight thousand three hundred forty-five people have been killed, but that number could be far, far, far higher. Previous estimates are putting it much higher than that. I don't want to speculate, but we're looking at those stories as they evolve. It's brutal. You have. 1.5 million people that ended up in South Gaza in the footprint that originally had a population of 275,000 people and then you put 10 times that amount not 10 times but The casualty number would be far higher than originally estimated, as we've covered before. Because just rubble everywhere and bodies everywhere. There's no moving the dead. It's just dead everywhere. More than 15,000 children killed and more than 10,000 missing. Israel does not check the rubble for survivors. The number could be far greater, far higher. And if the Lancet, which published numbers of over 180,000, would this be true? But really, four to five times the amount of people are thought to have been killed in this war in Gaza. The number could be far higher due to the amount of people that are constantly moving and migrating between north and south, central Gaza, trying to find safety. There's no running water. There's no security. We have trained soldiers that are killing people, waving white flags. You have drones with speakers making the sounds of children in trouble draw people to sniper fire sniper fire it's hell what are we supposed to do if the numbers for the Lancet are real the number is probably more of the 180,000 that have been killed what does that say about the authority and power in Gaza how are they so far off in their estimates 
in their counting of the dead, even in the estimates of the lost. You put the amount of missing, and with those killed, it still is not enough. How can there have been so many more people killed than originally estimated? This from the Lancet. More than 186,000 dead in Gaza. It, uh, Based on the 2022 Gaza Strip population estimate of 2,375,259, this would translate to 7.9% of the total population in the Gaza Strip, writes the co-authors of this letter published in the correspondence section of the website. Gaza Health Ministry. How can they be so far off such a magnitude? How is that possible? How is it possible to undercount so much? Are the, is the rubble just so great? People just everywhere? The bombs are very concussive. People not surviving. These blasts. The people that survive, where do they go? What are they to do? This is a nightmare. This is hell. There is nothing that we can do. We've tried useless pier, floating pier that didn't really do anything. We tried dropping aid in. Are we too afraid that Israel will shoot down our plane if we drop down aid closer to where it needs to be? Instead of on the coast, where people drown trying to get the aid. This is uh, big news coming out from BBC from Poland. Poland considers downing Russian missiles over Ukraine. This is big news considering that these missiles have been on the border of Poland and Ukraine for some time now. Polish Foreign Minister Radoslaw Rakowski has said Warsaw is considering a proposal from Kiev to shoot down Russian missiles heading towards Polish territory while they are still in Ukrainian airspace. This is pretty big news. At this stage, this is an idea. What our agreement said is that we will explore this idea. He said some Russian missiles fired from St. Petersburg area towards Ukrainian targets near the western city of Lviv are not far from the Polish border. Traversed Belarus and entered Polish airspace for about 40 seconds before turning towards their targets in Ukraine. <laughs> Such a short time gave Poland little time to react.
our dilemma is the following. If we shoot them down only when they enter our airspace, the debris is a threat to our citizens and to our property. This is a really big deal. Russia has long been playing this game of uh, riding the border of Ukraine and Poland with missiles, cruise missiles, for some time now. With uh, missiles even being taken down that have killed farmers, destroyed equipment, burned land. Russia, these are high precision weapons. The fact that they're dancing on the border, like we're seeing, And the Ukrainians are saying, please, we do not, will not mind. Do it over our airspace when they're in imminent danger of crossing into Polish territory. Ukraine agrees. Shoot the missiles down. Help us out. <laughs> they're going to hit a place at full target, which will probably be... energy related like Russia has been targeting energy facilities just ruthlessly thermal power plants energy uh, facilities hydroelectric plant uh, dams Russia has been attacking the energy and energy infrastructure throughout Ukraine while also having missiles that are hovering over the border of Poland and Ukraine probably daily at this point two Polish citizens had been killed by falling debris when Ukraine shot down a Russian missile near the Polish border a month earlier Here's Ukraine, the current live uh, alert map. I have like cruise missiles that come through. Go into Moldova for a second as well. Right here. Going back some happy news. Officials rejoice as salmon spawn for first time in 100 years following dam removal project. It is very rewarding. After more than 100 years of being blocked from the area, Atlantic salmon have been able to spawn in the upper waters of the river Derwent thanks to removal of a weir in their way.
a weir. A weir is like a flat dam. Salmon are some of the most well-known species of fish that spend their lives at sea but swim up rivers to lay eggs and hatch the next generation. Atlantic salmon, which can be found in the North Atlantic Ocean, use to spawn in many rivers, including the River Derwent. However, in the last few centuries, humanity has had a massive impact on rivers. In addition to being polluted, many rivers have been dredged, straightened, or dammed, physically destroying the routes of spawning salmon. Rising temperature of the planet, which has caused droughts and dried up rivers, have has compounded the problem. Now, though, many people are working on restoring these aquatic roots to the so that salmon can once again swim up river as they are driven to do hopefully increasing the dwindling salmon population. We looked at salmon before, the different kinds of salmon. A previous stream. Locals in England have been working on the health of the river Derwent for years. However, Fizz.org reveals one remaining barrier, Snake Lane Weir. A low dam meant to raise the water level up water level up river from it. We'd start started to see large salmon turning up in the Derwent in winter, said direct Dr. Tim Jacklin, a conservation officer for the Wild Trout Trust per Phys at Org. They became sort of local celebrities really. People were going out of their had torches at night and looking into the river, so they attracted quite a lot of attention. But it also highlighted the fact that Snake Lane Weir was a complete barrier to fish getting upstream. Spurred by this knowledge, locals removed the concrete weir and replaced it with older rapids that would do the same job while allowing fish upriver to where it becomes equals born. It's very rewarding. We opened up a good 6.2 miles of spawning habitat upstream, so that translates into hundreds more juvenile salmon that make their way downstream and hopefully to come back and spawn. This is great news for the fish and also for everyone who relies on the salmon population for food. Discovery in South Africa, world's oldest inhabited termite mounds dating back 34,000 years. So the discovery of the age of termite mounds was permitted by rigorous samples of radiocarbon dating, which brought some of the mounds as old as 34,000 years. They're everywhere too, I mean, incredible. Still being used by these uh, termites. Also, other animals use these mounds as well. They have aardvarks that'll dig holes in them. They have hyenas that will raise their young in them. Hyenas are especially strange animals. Probably one of the strangest animals on the planet. But that's probably that's for another day. And talk about hyena all day.
This is from the Guardian. Migration of 6 million antelope in South Sudan dwarfs previous records for world's biggest aerial studies reveals. Tying a species of antelope form part of the migration between the Boma and Bad Dingilo National Parks in South Sudan, the world's largest sub movement. The movement is more than double that of East Africa's renowned Great Migration has continued despite decades of war and instability. The migration in South Sudan blows any other migration we know out of the water. Absolutely incredible. In 2007, a Wildlife Conservation Society survey suggests that South Sudan's migration involved about 1.3 million animals, but African Parks, which manages Boma and Benjilo National Parks in the southeast of South Sudan, on behalf of the government, have been able to provide a more accurate count using improved technology and assessing a more comprehensive area. Two planes were kitted out with cameras programmed to take a photo every two seconds. This produced 330,000 images, which were studied by University of Juba graduates using software to count the wildlife. Seeing these animals here at such scale is something I could have never phantom still existed on the planet. From the air, it felt like I was watching what Earth might have been like a millennia ago, when nature and humans still exist together in balance. The estimates indicated 5 million white-eared cob, just under 300,000 Taiyang, 350,000 Mangala gazelle, and 160,000 Bohar reedbuck, the four species of antelope totaling just under 6 million. They said that figure means this Great Nile migration of antelope is the largest on Earth, according to our data dwarfing any other known land mammal migration on the planet. Hmm. Unfortunately, I think that's going to be all the time I have for today. I thank you very much.
for following me. Thank you very much for viewing this, even if it's on replay. I have many other stories that I would like to get into. But fortunately, I'm out of time. I thank you very much for your viewership. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Please take care.